Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of the 6G Talks by 6G Flagship. Today, we are going to talk about critical machine type communications towards 6G, and it will be presented by Professor Onel Lopez and myself, Nurul Huda Mahmoud. Okay, so go ahead, Nurul, and take the first shot. Thank you. So here, we can see the famous 5G triangle that was introduced in 2015. This introduced the notion of multi-service communication with three distinct service classes, namely extreme mobile broadband, massive machine type communications, and critical machine type communications, or URLLC. Each of these services has their own sets of requirements, as you can see here. While we still do not know for sure what 6G will be, this figure here, released by International Telecommunications Union, or ITU, is a draft proposal of the usage scenarios of IMT 2030, which will define what 6G will be. We can see here that the 5G triangle will continue to evolve with more requirements, and at the same time, new dimensions will be introduced, such as integrated sensing and communication, integrated AI and communication, and ubiquitous connectivity. The outer circle of this figure here shows the different drivers of 6G design, which will be, for example, sustainability, connecting the unconnected or providing connectivity to the people who are not yet connected, for example, in remote areas or rural areas, ubiquitous intelligence or the widespread adoption of AI and artificial intelligence and machine learning, and then finally, security, privacy, and resilience, mo mostly targeted towards industrial networks. In this talk, we will focus on one of these edges, which is the evolution of URLC, namely hyper-reliable and low-latency communications, or critical machine type communications. So this is the brief outline of the talk. First, we will try to answer some questions. So why critical machine type communications? Why do we need this URLC? And how it will evolve towards 6G? Then we look into some of the basics, fundamentals, so information and communication theoretic fundamentals of critical machine type communication. Thereafter, we will look into some of the challenges and some of the statistical tools that we can use to design critical machine type communication solutions, followed by some of the enablers of CM, uh, CMTC, and finally, then an outlook towards 6G, so a bit looking into how it will evolve towards the 6G era. So let's try to answer these questions of why critical machine type communications. Although wireless communications was introduced in the 1980s through analog systems like AMPS or advanced mobile phone systems, it was globally adopted in the 2G era through the highly successful GSM system. Currently, there are over 5 billion unique mobile subscribers worldwide. So that's more than 70% of the world population. And today, 4G, or the fourth generation, is the most widely used technology, constituting more than half of the wireless networks deployed worldwide. Since its launch and up until the 4G era, wireless networks were primarily designed to connect people as many of us may recall from this famous Nokia motto, connecting people. And towards this end, the main design goal was to maximize the average performance. And this was because the corresponding design requirements were geared towards human communication, and therefore, very stringent requirements were not needed. For example, latency less than 10 milliseconds is not noticeable by a human ear. And similarly, a small percentage of error has little impact. So a few dots in a video 
cannot be really uh, recognized by human eyes. However, this is fast changing with the advent of IoT and MTC, or Internet of Things and machine type communications. While this communication is now evolving from connecting people to connecting things towards a connectivity as a service model. Already today, the number of IoT connections exceeds the number of mobile connections. And this sector is expected to grow at a cumulative annual growth rate of 13% in the next five years. The figure you see here is for cellular IoT connections. But if you consider also other technologies like low power wide area networks or LoRa, MWAN and so on, then the number of connections is much more and then the growth rate is also closer to 20%. Machine type communication was already being served by wireless networks from the 2G era. So for example, connecting point of sales terminals using GSM connections or the support of LPWAN in LTE, such as narrowband IoT in LTE. And this culminated in a dedicated service classes for machine type communication in the 5G era, namely the MMTC and URLC service classes. And we may note here that different MTC applications have different design requirements, with critical machine type communication being the most challenging MTC segment because of its stringent, stringent reliability and low latency requirements, among other design requirements. Despite the huge potential of 5G URLC, most of the current solutions are not able to meet the stringent requirements on a large scale. And this also we can see from the quite slow adoption of 5G URLC in the market. It is not really being taken up by the market. So why does this happen? Why is this phenomenon? One of the main reasons that we can attribute is the design cycle of critical machine type communications, which is very different from what we have been used to so far. So I mean the conventional EMBB use cases. So if you look at the conventional EMBB design cycle, usually demand is supply driven. So for example, a new feature or a new network is released and then it is taken up by the market. So we can see from this figure here, in April 2019, the first 5G network was launched in South Korea. And since then, the number of 5G subscribers is increasing and it's being taken up by the market. This is not the same with critical machine type communications. In fact, the opposite can be observed. So critical machine type communication is very much demand driven. Here, we already have existing services or existing products that meets the requirements of the wireless networks. For example, if you look at an industry, then there's already existing products that meets the requirements of critical machine type communication in the industry. So if you want to introduce a 5G URLC type of services, then the service quality needs to meet these specific requirements and it needs to be as good as what is already there in the industry or what is already there existing solutions. On the other hand, many of the conventional design criteria are less relevant. For example, with conventional 5G, it needs to be backward compatible with 4G and so on. But with, let's say, 5G URLC, this requirement is not there. Similarly, new requirements are needed. For example, end-to-end -end performance measures, cost efficiency, seamless coverage with existing technologies, and so on. Overall, the design requirements of critical machine type communication is a bit different from the conventional communication. And that's why we need new approaches or new design initiatives for this domain. Okay, now I pass the ball to my colleague, Professor Onel, to take you through the fundamental communication and information theoretic basics of critical machine type communications. So now let's go and re revise some communication information theoretical aspects uh, regarding critical machine type communications. First of all, we must understand that latency and reliability are inherently tied by definition 
latency is basically the maximum time admitted to successfully deliver a packet from a given layer at the transmitter to a given layer at the receiver. While reliability is the probability of successfully delivering a packet from the transmitter to the receiver under a given latency constraint or, or deadline. And in fact, the typical critical MTC requirement as defined by 3GPP imposed that a 32-byte packet is successfully delivered 99.999 percentage of the time under a user plane latency constraint of one millisecond. And this is over a point-to-point -point link. The relationship between latency and reliability can be easily understood maybe if we look at this figure here to the bottom left where the probability of meeting a given deadline t is plotted. This probability of violating the deadline is basically non-decreasing as you can see but it's not completely increasing so there is a asymptotic behavior and this gap is termed asymptotic probability of residual packet loss. And this basically reflects the fact that some packets will never be delivered due to, for instance, uh, limits on the number of retransmissions in the link layer protocols, or buffer overflows, synchronization issues, uh, etc. So let's now discuss a bit about uh, communication theoretical fundamentals. Here in the screen we have the channel capacity formulation, or spectral efficiency, or achievable rate for an AWGN channel, uh, which depends on the SINR of the channel as original given by Shannon many decades ago. And in fading channels, in fact, this channel capacity due to the random fading is a random variable. And then this is the achievable rate over infinite coherence time realizations, which can be computed by average over all the different realizations of the SINR. And this is termed ergodic capacity in fading channels. However, such performance metrics, which are useful for human-type communications, are not relevant for machine-type communication anymore, especially critical MTC. Um, the reason is simple, because the goal is to satisfy a given reliability and latency requirements. Uh, it is therefore more practical to investigate what's the achievable rate given error rate requirements, which leads to the notation of E outage capacity, as given in this formulation here, which is basically the rate that can be achieved under a given reliability uh, constraint. Another reason is that messages are inherently short. So if we assume that the message comprises n symbols, then we can formulate the rate as the equation given to the right here, which is basically the second order achievable rate and depends basically on the block length n. There are not exact formulations or exact expression on how this dependence is. But we have like a bound for a WGN channels, which is basically dependent on the channel dispersion V and also on the target uh, error rate epsilon. Another thing is that traffic is often sporadic and rates are fixed. Thus, it's not often a matter of maximizing the achievable rate, but of meeting a given error probability requirement with the given rate that uh, given by the system. So let's look now at the packet structure. Messages in human type communications are large, so metadata is comparatively small, which makes the design of metadata much less impactful. So even without good metadata processing capabilities and optimizations, the performance is not affected significantly in human type communications. However, this is not the case in MTC because the payload may be as short as the metadata. Therefore, optim optimized metadata and related procedures are needed. And also, the metadata in MTC may include end device ID and authentication, and there might be even symbols reserved for supporting auxiliary procedures, such as synchronous packet detection and packet integrity verification. And different than before, the performance of the correct coding and successful implementation of these functions may be in the same order as the payload detection capabilities, and thus must be considered and optimized accordingly. Finally, there are also different ways in which these pilots, which are related to the metadata and auxiliary procedures, may, may be encoded. For instance, the more conventional way, illustrated here as regular pilots, this is the most common one, 
but there are also options of superimposing pilots on the payload and even adopting pilots encoded by the, the data itself. And this is especially relevant in low rate applications, especially in massive MTC scenarios. Regarding access protocols for critical MTC and MTC in general, uh, we must say that they significantly from those for human type communications. So the traditional full handshake protocol for granting access uh, to these devices are not often affordable in critical MTC and MTC in general as they incur excessive delay and energy and they add also additional sources of error to the system. So instead, a number of access protocols, uh, more uh, lightweight, have been proposed for machine type communications and each one with its own uh, pros and cons, and especially given the critical MTC uh, requirements. That is the case of semi-persistent scheduling which is a grant-based access method where grants are pre-allocated periodically for a number of transmissions. So AUE doesn't have to go through the grant acquisition process every time it has a packet to transmit. In this way, we can reduce the associated signaling overhead and latency. However, this may lead to resource wastage, especially if the AUE doesn't have a packet to transmit for each scheduled grant. Also, it may incur additional access delay if the packet arrival does not match strictly uh, with the granted schedule. There is also a fast uplink process, which is, of course, as the name suggests, is also based on grants. And in this case, the best station grants access to the UEs in given resource blocks. And this is done proactively by exploiting traffic prediction mechanism. So the role of machine learning and AI here is very important. But the, the main challenge here lies in the need for accurate traffic predictors, which obviously is not possible, at least completely, in certain scenarios, such as when the devices get activated sporadically based on rare events, like an alarm scenario or something. On the other side, there are uncoordinated grant-free uh, protocols, which completely avoid uh, these exchanging procedures and control signaling for establishing a connection. So they might be especially appealing in scenarios with extremely tight latency constraint or a relatively large number of users to be served. For these uh, protocols, each UE transmits its data in an arrive and go manner uh, using the nearest pre-configured grant-free uh, resource blocks. Collisions may occur, and this uh, obviously calls for collision avoidance resolution mechanism, which in general can be uh, implemented through repetitions or retransmissions if time allows it, but also via physical layer multi-user detection, like exploiting multiple antennas and these kind of procedures. So let's just assume that we are able to satisfy the critical MTC performance requirements of a certain application, say in terms of latency and reliability. So the question is then how to promote low energy consumption, how to provide high data rate, how to promote high scalability, let's say in terms of number of users or coverage, uh, while satisfying these critical MTC requirements. Well, obviously it's not possible to have all of these together, but it is interesting to investigate the performance limits, the performance trade-offs related to all these metrics, because although it's not a matter of meeting all simultaneously, it's a matter of exploring the limits of the technology itself. So it's important to acknowledge that there are fundamental limits to show how much performance can be achieved in these dimensions, in the ener energy rate and scalability dimensions simultaneously. And the efforts may be focused on identifying such boundaries accurately and getting close to them as, uh, as much as possible uh, by exploding innovative techniques and technologies that are currently available or available in the near future. So le let's go now a bit more into the challenges of design tools. The, the previous uh, discussions were more or less common knowledge for people or for researchers working on, on critical machine type communication or URLC. So let's delve more into what are the current challenges of design tools uh, that are required to address these challenges. First of all, in critical MTC, 
it is of paramount importance to consider all the potential end-to-end -end delay and error sources. For instance, if we go to the delay sources, we might have queuing, computation at the cloud side, propagation backhaul over the channels, queuing and processing uh, at the transmit nodes or receive node as well, and there are the access procedures related delay at the nodes themselves. In terms of error sources, there might be data corruption at the cloud, fading and interference can cause serious error issues in the channels, the availability of transmit and reception resources at the nodes, the noise and synchronization issues can affect and can be error sources as well. Very importantly is that the critical sources of error and delay may depend heavily on the considered communication topology, of course on the use cases. For instance, in local area networks, like the one to the left, where we have a vehicular communication setup, propagation delay and backhaul delay may be negligible, but that may not be the case for mobile edge computing, as they figure in the center, which involves the transmission of the packets to central servers via multi-hop uh, backhaul. In such cases, the processing computation delay could be comparable to other delay components and must be considered. Finally, in the wide area or large-scale critical MTC networks, the core network delay may be significant and then it can be affected the delay the mo most significantly than the other sources. Finally, and very important, is that each of these delay and error sources have their own characteristic statistical and randomness behavior, and all of them should be carefully considered when designing the solutions. Note also that industrial applications requiring critical MTC are usually cyber-physical systems. So in a cyber-physical system, a mechanism or object in the physical space is represented in cyberspace and monitored and controlled according to the corresponding application via a computer algorithm. In general, these cyber-physical systems rely on embed embedded, decentralized and real-time computations and interactions where the physical and software components are deeply intertwined. All these components are able to operate on different spatial and temporal scales and can exhibit multiple and distinct behavioral modalities. And also they can interact with each other in ways that change with context. However, current 5G approaches for meeting critical MTC requirements uh, are based on tweaking the system design and therefore they are not scalable nor efficient to satisfy these requirements. Therefore, future networks need to make use of application domain information to predict the actual resource requirements. So the main question is how to address all the intricate challenges discussed so far uh, related to critical MTC design and analysis for current and future wireless communication systems generation. So yes, designing and supporting critical MTC poses a Herculean task due to the fundamental need to identify and accurately characterize the underlying uh, statistical phenomena and models in which the critical MTC systems operate. For, for instance, the interference statistics, channel conditions, and the behavior of protocols. All of them are statistical random processes. Taking them into account will ultimately be required for providing a strong quality of service uh, guarantees. All of these call for multi-layer end-to-end approaches and proper methodologies uh, and statistical tools uh, as the one that we are going to discuss briefly next. For instance, reliability theory. Uh, reliability theory comprises a set of uh, mathematical tools, methods, for analyzing uh, the life cycles and failures of uh, technical systems. And a wireless communication system can be composed of several items like transmitters, receivers, corresponding components and delay error sources as we saw before. And therefore it can be somehow uh, mimicked by using reliability theory framework. Uh, in this case, reliability refers more to dependability in the context of reliability theory, which is a broader concept that encompasses also availability reliability, maintainability, and in some cases even durability, resiliency, safety, and security. So critical MTC beyond 5G 
must support a dependability, as will be discussed by Nurul a bit later. But it is important that the reliability theory framework, which comes from system engineering, and uh, it must be properly adapted to wireless communications and civil physical system engineering. Also, the design of critical MTC or ULLC is about taming the currency of extreme and rare events, specifically the tail distribution of latency and reliability system performance. For this, tools like inequalities and distribution bounds and also extreme value theory are necessary to basically characterize and tame such distribution tails. This includes limiting forms, generalized Markov inequality, which also comprise many well-known bounds, but also other less known bounds as these pilot Sigmund, Hoefdin, and, and many others. Also, estimating the extreme values of an underlying process, which by definition they are scarce, inevitably requires extrapolation from available observations, which can be facilitated by the EBT uh, framework. These tools, along with others from finance and portfolio optimization, also meta probabilities, must be leveraged to realize risk based optimizations and learning, which can provide robust reliability and latency guarantees in critical MTC system design. Very related to this is the recurrent need to simulate the occurrences of rare events. Basically, this is needed for simulating the performance of critical MTC systems. There is a fundamental need for computational affordable methods that can allow evaluating reliability levels in the order of five or more nines by effectively sampling the region of the distribution domain where the such rare events occur. You may recall that traditional Monte Carlo methods require generating at least 10 to the power 7 samples to accurately simulate error probabilities in the order of 10 to minus 6. So that's a huge amount of samples, and sometimes this is even not possible to process. So rare event simulation tool like important sampling, Markov chain, Monte Carlo, subset simulation can be handy for reducing the number of required samples. Meanwhile, Q in theory and information freshness tools like effective capacity, stochastic network calculus, and age of information are appealing for assessing and designing uh, multi-layer approaches. It must be noted that traffic queues in critical MTC are often short, with only occasional boards of short packets. So it's important to be prepared for such critical situations, for which effective capacity, effective bandwidth, and stochastic network calculus may be used in conjunction with previously mentioned tools for taming, simulating distribution tails. Something similar may happen with the age of information, which is useful for capturing information freshness. In such cases, rather than traditional average AOI, the focus must be on peak and tail age metrics, for which, again, we can use the tools that we mentioned before related to inequality bounds and distribution bounds and the EBT framework, etc. There is another group of tools which are useful for scaling critical MTC or analyzing the performance of large-scale critical MTC, and that is the case of decentralized machine learning approaches such as federated learning, multi-agent reinforcement learning, and deep reinforcement learning, which can be applied to reduce the state space in extremely high-dimensional problems. Also, there are clustering approaches, which is basically a type of unsupervised machine learning, and mean field games, which may, may be appealing as well in these uh, setups. Meanwhile, compressed sensing, which is an established tool for performing user and data detection in large-scale MTC, especially with sporadic activations, may be necessary to be exploited also for scaling URLC service. However, we might need to incorporate a high reliability or low latency promoting mechanism to be able to support uh, the requirements of critical MTC in these setups. How to do that is open for research, and we have been working on that uh, for some time already. All in all, there is a fundamental need for holistic integration of all these tools and realizing robust methodologies 
for addressing the many critical MTC challenges, especially in practical setups and problems. Note that there is also the dilemma, especially nowadays with the rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence, on whether to use model or data-driven approaches. And the pros and cons of each variant must be properly understood before making a choice for a particular problem. For instance, uh, model-driven approaches exploit mathematical models that describe the system behavior based on a prior knowledge of its physical and operational characteristics, while data-driven approaches leverage empirical data to extract and infer patterns and relationships without necessarily making assumptions about the underlying statistical process. Usually, model-driven approaches are simpler, but uh, may have limited accuracy, flexibility, especially in complex and dynamic environments. And this is basically due to the inherent underlying assumptions. While data-driven approaches like machine learning are particularly useful when the underlying statistical models are difficult to characterize or when the system is highly nonlinear or unpredictable, as they may successfully capture complex system behaviors and interactions. However, they face serious challenges related to overfitting lack of interpretability and high data requirements, and even sensitivity to data quality as well. Although the immense benefits from machine learning it might not be always suitable for handling strict critical requirements due to the difficulty in exploiting prior contextual information, due to limited availability of large training data sets and high computation complexity and incur delay. Also, there is the issue of the black box nature of some machine learning algorithms, which make it difficult to understand their decision-making process and establish certain confidence levels. So, due to these limitations, there have been some novel approaches, such as explainable machine learning, which facilitates understanding the machine learning decision-making process. And this may allow increased transparency and trust in the algorithms. Ensemble learning, which involves combining multiple machine learning models to improve the accuracy and robustness of the predictions. And also transfer learning, uh, federated learning, and meta-learning, which are especially efficient in low data scenarios. Interesting if we can be able to integrate domain knowledge from the models and non-physical knowledge into the data-driven approaches, while also exploiting established tools and methodologies available for the design and analysis of critical MTC, then we can come up with robust critical MTC design. So let's go back to Nurul where he will continue with potential enabling technologies for critical MTC. Let us now look at some of the potential enabling technologies for critical machine type communications. So here we have a list, a non-exhaustive list of some of the enablers that can be used as potential critical machine type communication enablers. As we all know, interference is one of the main bottlenecks in wireless communication. With cell-free and distributed massive MIMO, we can design distributed precoders that can enable interference-free or that can enable effective management of the interference in a multi-user network. Then time-sensitive networking, or TSN, which has been introduced to allow controlled and prioritization of message flows between multiple hops in an end-to-end -end network, which will allow reliable and deterministic delivery of packets for machine-type communications or for critical machine-type communications, for example, in industrial networks. Then. We know that artificial intelligence or machine learning can be used to solve many optimization problems and other problems in many different domains. And also for wireless communication, they have been used in solving many different problems. But one of the problem with AI is that it's black box. We do not know what is happening in between. So there's this new trend towards explainable AI which can be used to solve some of these problems 
or can be used as an enabler in critical machine type communication as well. Then we have edge computing, which tries to bring computing resources very much close to the end device so that we can cut down the latency or so that we can reduce some of the latency sources that Onel introduced earlier in critical machine type communication. And finally, we have reconfigurable intelligent services or RIS, which can be used to control the wireless propagation environment to shape the propagation, for example, to boost the SINR or to cancel some of the interference. And this can be used also as an enabler for critical machine type communication to improve the performance. Of course, due to time constraint, we'll not go through all of this, but we'll look into selective examples of some of these enablers. So first, let's look at this explainable and risk-sensitive AI. Onel talked to you already about this integration of domain knowledge in machine learning. And this re results in what we know as deep unfolding. We know that domain knowledge has its advantage because we can somehow model the problem. At the same time, it has some limitations because complex problems cannot be modeled due to the complexity. On the other hand, deep learning can solve some problems, but then if we do not know or if we do not integrate the domain knowledge, then we are somehow operating in a black box regime. So if we integrate these two together, so if we integrate domain knowledge with deep learning, we can try to have come up with a good or effective solutions that addresses the limitations of both of these approaches. So we have this table here, which shows some of this. So for example, the complexity can be much lower. The performance can be comparable to the traditional schemes. And at the same time, we may also get some understanding of how the solution works and why it is working. So what are the steps to integrate this domain knowledge in deep learning? This is, of course, one list. Different approaches can be taken as well. But here, for example, so first we choose a numeric algorithm that we would like to solve. So for example, we choose a domain knowledge algorithm that we would like to implement that can solve our problem at hand. Then we need to identify what to learn. So which parts of this algorithm can we learn? For example, the step size or some of the hyperparameters of the algorithm. Then we build and train a machine learning model to learn these specific parts of this algorithm. And then finally, we use integrate these two together to apply to solve this problem. So here is an example of adopting this approach. In the case of optimizing the phase shifts of an RIS or reconfigurable intelligent surface. So we consider this, this system here that you see. So we have multiple users where a base station is transmitting to these multiple users and we have an RIS and we need to optimize the phase shift such that uh, received SINR is boosted at all of these users. So this is a complex problem because of these multiple users here. So if we use then this machine learning, this deep unfolding approach and try to optimize some of these parts of the algorithm using machine learning, then we can as you can see here in the bottom row, the results, with this approach, we can achieve quite good performance. For example, the, the performance is actually uh, much higher compared to if you do not use the RIS. So the result is comparable to this alternating optimization ap approach. At the same time, the complexity is reduced by 95% compared to this AO or alternating optimization approach. Uh, next example that we will take is about RIS again. So how can you use RIS to enable smart wireless environment? So here you can see that we have, for example, multiple base stations transmitting to multiple users. And then RIS can be used, for example, to boost the SINR at a, our user of choice, or for example, to cancel or obstruct the interference from another base station. Of course, here this requires optimizing the phase shift of the RIS so that this RIS has different these elements that can be optimized based on the design requirements. So we need to know this channel state information 
to optimize these phase shifts. So usually, usually this results in an optimization problem with multiple users or multiple objectives and which leads to a nonlinear and non-convex optimization problem. And then model free, free deep reinforcement learning algorithms can be used to address such optimization challenges. <laughs> So here we have example of some results of applying DRL algorithms uh, for optimizing the phase shift in RIS. The figure to the left shows uh, the error probability as a function of the number of RIS elements for different settings. And for example, if we have quantization of the RIS phase elements, which happens in practice, then we can see that we lose some of the performance because of this quantization. So the figure on the right shows us the average rate of a system with RIS considering different beta mean parameter. This beta mean parameter models the non-idealities of the RIS with beta mean equal to one being a perfect RIS. And as you can see here, this rate is the finite block length rate. So we try to optimize the finite block length rate with RIS. And as you increase, of course, the non-idealities of the RIS, then the performance drops, which is as expected. The next example that we will take is about emergent communication protocol learning for task offloading in industrial IoT network. So here we consider a system where we have multiple agents that you can see here. This is an edge computing, so the task can be offloaded from the end device, which is this machine that we see here, or robotic arm, to the base station, which has the edge computing services, or edge services, which has more computing resources. So the limitation is that the IoT device needs to process tasks in a timely, reliable, and efficient way, but it has limited computing capabilities and limited power. Okay? So if its computing capabilities are not enough, then it needs to offload some of the task to the base station or to the edge network. And then the problem is how to communicate with each other to solve this problem of joint offloading decision and scheduling of computational tasks such that the performance can be optimized. And in this case, the performance that we are looking into is the number of successfully computed tasks. So we tried to model this problem as an MARL, multi-agent reinforcement learning problem, where the states are the states of the devices, so whether they're performing a task or not, and so on, uh, as well as the base station, and then also the channel occupancy, so the communication uh, channel between them. And then the actions are task offloading, so whether to offload a task or to do the task itself. Channel selection, so which channel to use for communicating the message to the base station, and then, of course, the uplink and downlink messages to transmit. And the reward is based on the task completion within a delay deadline. So because of this IoT or critical machine type communication, we have stringent deadline on the delay. So the task needs to be completed within the delay deadline. And the result here shows that with our proposed approach, so the top part here with the purplish line, where the devices can also communicate it, it with each other, then we can see that the number of successfully computed tasks is the highest. If they do not communicate with each other, which is this blue line, then we see that, yes, still we have some of these, let's say, uh, tasks completed, but it's less than with communication. And then if we do not have this kind of learning and task offloading, then of course the number of successfully computed tasks is much less because of this delay constraints and also the limited power and computing resources at the end devices. So with that, we're approaching towards the end of this presentation. So let's look at the key takeaways from this presentation. We said in the beginning that we will try to answer some of these questions or this talk will address these topics. So why critical machine type communication? And in this domain, we said that we need new design models, which reflects the reality of the applications of critical machine type communication, which is quite different from the conventional design goals of EMBB. Then also the 
critical machine type communications they address different verticals for example industrial iot or let's say autonomous vehicles and so on and each of these verticals have their own design needs so the solution needs to meet the design requirements of the different verticals specific to that vertical and also unlike embb we have stringent requirements uh, for critical machine type communication and at the same time, some of the design goals of EMBB do not apply here, for example, backward compatibility. Then, in terms of the information and communication theoretic fundamentals, we looked into this rate, latency, and reliability trade-off. Then also we looked into the average capacity to outage capacity to the finite block length error rate, which comes into effect because many of the messages in critical machine type communication are short messages with small payload and a small block length. And because of this small block length, the conventional information theory results do not apply here. Then finally, we also saw that there are overheads due to metadata and control channels, which becomes important in critical machine type communication, which we could otherwise, for conventional EMBB, we could ignore. Then, in terms of the challenges and design tools, we looked into the multiple sources of delays and errors, which are the most important KPIs in critical machine type communication. Then we also saw how critical machine type communication can support CPS or cyber physical systems. We looked into some of the performance limits. And then finally, we saw a brief overview of different statistical tools that can be used to design and analyze critical machine type communication solutions. Then finally, we looked into some of the CMTC enablers, such as self-free distributed massive MIMO, explainable and risk-sensitive AI, edge computing, RIS, and time-sensitive networking, where we looked into some specific examples of some of these enablers, but we did not have time to go through all of them. And finally, looking towards 6G, we may just briefly note here that Critical machine type communications need to be scalable and energy efficient. This is because if you want to deploy these solutions at large with many devices, then energy efficiency or the energy consumptions become important. And at the same time, solutions need to be scalable with large number of users. Then moving from, let's say, what we are doing now, end-to-end -end performance guarantees become more and more important towards 60 for example, when we have, let's say, multiple AGVs or automated guided vehicles carrying a task or doing a task from one end to another end. Then another thing that will be important in 6G is these KPIs beyond reliability and low latency. So we'll have KPIs such as jitter or synchronization error, which will become more important as we move towards 6G. Then we also need distributed solutions because of the problems at hand. And finally, dependability and resiliency will become important as key, let's say, performance indicators or key value indicators of critical machine type communication towards 6G. So this was our talk. Thank you very much for watching. Here is our content in case you want to share some feedback. Thank you very much.